All right. Renee's mind went back to this, to his last night at Mr. Benedict's house. It seemed so long ago, and yet he remembered it with absolute clarity, much like tonight. He had felt too worked up to sleep, and despite the late hour, he had slipped quietly out of bed and crept down to Mr. Benedict's study. Mr. Benedict had welcomed Rene to sit up with him if he had trouble sleeping, and obviously he'd quite expected Rene to do so, for when Rene arrived, a cup of hot tea was waiting for him on Mr. Benedict's desk. There was even a little jar of honey, and judging from the way Mr. Benedict's paper stuck to his fingers as he worked, he had already been into it himself. You have a question for me, Mr. Benedict said as Rene sat down. Rene laughed. How do you always know? I'm not sure, Mr. Benedict admitted. Perhaps it's a matter of empathy. I know that if I were you, I'd have questions. He scratched the top of his head with one of his pencils. Though, come to think of it, perhaps it's a matter of odds. You seem the type to always have questions. Thus, at any given moment, it's a safe bet for me to assume that you have one. I was wondering if you ever wish you had a family. Renee sputtered. He hadn't meant to speak so directly, but once he'd begun to ask it, the words just tumbled out. Mr. Benedict nodded. Certainly when I was your age, I did, but not anymore. Rene wasn't sure whether to be comforted or depressed by this revelation. He'd been wondering how it would feel for him to grow up without relatives. You, you grew out of it then? You stopped wanting it? Oh, no, Rene. You don't grow out of it. It's just that once you acquire a family, you no longer need to wish for one. Rene was caught off guard. You have a family? Absolutely, Mr. Benedict replied. You must remember family is often born of blood, but it doesn't depend on blood. Nor is it exclusive of friendship. Family members can be your best friends, you know, and best friends, whether or not they are related to you, can be your family. Rene had drunk up those words like life-saving medicine. Even though the next morning, he would leave on a dangerous mission. Even though he knew something terrible was coming down the pike, those words of Mr. Benedict had made all good things seem possible. Rene had gone to bed thinking of the people he might one day, if anything, turned out all right, consider a part of his family. And now, lying in his dark room at the Institute in an altogether different mood, Rene finished the letter he had begun to one of those very people. At least I had you, Miss Pernomo, if only for a while. Maybe you weren't my family, but you were the closest thing I had. Maybe that I'd ever have. And now things are awful and seem, to like get, seem likely to get worse. And I worry that I'll never have the chance to tell you what you meant to me. Rene whispered Sticky from the bunk below. Rene cleared his throat. Yes? Were you having a bad dream? It sounded like you were crying. Rene wiped his eyes. I, I just can't get over what he'd done to those poor people. I know, Sticky said. It's maddening to think what might be in that journal of his. To think there might be something we could use to stop him, but I know there's no way we can lay hands on it. <laughs> Rene sat bolt upright. Sticky! Sticky near, nearly fell out of his bed. What? What is it? Maybe we're looking at this the wrong way, Renee said. Maybe we don't have to lay hands on it. Uh, the next one is called Tactical Cactopi. The last class was dismissed into a perfect fall afternoon. Blue skies, cool temperatures, and the subtlest of breezes. The sun seemed to rest upon a distant hilltop like a giant orange on a giant table. On the plaza, Mr. Curtin sat in his favorite spot, gazing off toward the bridge, reading a newspaper with a look of satisfaction, occasionally making a note in his journal. A few students had gathered at the edges of the plaza, and in the rock garden, passing the time before supper. 
As always, they gave Mr. Curtin plenty of room. No one dared to go near him while he was working, which is why so many jaws dropped when Renard Muldron was spotted walking toward him. Did the new kid not know any better? Was he just dying for his visit to the waiting room? No student had ever approached Mr. Curtin on the plaza before. Rene guessed this, which is why his breath came so short. But keeping his shoulder squared, one hand behind his back, he did what no other student dared to do. He approached from the front, knowing he would have only one shot at this. His plan would be spoiled if Mr. Curtin turned his chair. Mr. Curtin, sir. Mr. Curtin glanced up, his lenses gleaming like polished chrome in the sun. Sorry to bother you, Rene said quickly, but I couldn't help noticing that your book has a lot of dog-eared pages. I must say I was surprised. Mr. Curtin seemed unsure whether to be angry or incredulous. You're surprised I have pages to which I often refer? Oh, no, sir. I'm surprised nobody has ever given you a suitable present. Rene showed Mr. Curtin what he'd been holding behind his back. A fistful of thin blue ribbons. Bookmarkers. I thought they should be special, so I asked a laundry helper for some sash material. I'm sure you recognize the shade of blue, which she cut into ribbons and sewed up nicely along the edges. Renee held out the ribbons, which were indeed elegantly stitched. I hope you like them. Mr. Curtin was taken aback. He was flattered, it was true, yet his expression clearly showed that he agreed with Renee, that he'd rather thought someone should have given him such a present before now. It was a proper attention that he had been lacking. Thank you, Renard, he said with a tight nod. An appropriate gift indeed, from one young scholar to his superior. I shall put them to good use. Mr. Curtin returned to his newspaper. Sir, Rene said, aren't you going to put them in? Mr. Curtin grunted impatiently, his expression darkening. The boy was a nuisance. And yet the nuisance had flattered him and the ribbons would be useful. His expression softened a little. Finally, he sighed and he set aside his newspaper, flipping his journal back to the first dog-eared page. He slipped a ribbon inside. He was beginning to turn the page when Rene said, what exactly is that book, sir? Mr. Curtin paused. It's a journal, Renard. Every great thinker keeps a journal, you know. He returned to his bookmarking. I must say, and it's an awfully big journal. What better place to record awfully big ideas, eh? Mr. Curtin said, which was just what Rene had thought he would say. Now, Renard, no more interruptions. I have a great deal of work to do. Mr. Curtin flipped to the next dog-eared page. Sir, just one last question. A very last question, Renard, Mr. Curtin said, looking up. Go ahead. Why are you always gazing off toward the bridge? Ah, uh, I suppose it does appear that I'm looking at the bridge, Mr. Curtin said with a smile. In fact, I'm gazing fondly toward one of my greatest accomplishments, the tidal turbines. I trust you know about turbines, Rene nodded. I thought so. They're quite famous. They are an extraordinary invention, you see, and part of the great tradition. The great tradition? Do you not recall my mentioning of my homeland's admirable tradition? I was referring to the great conquest, the conquest of the sea. Holland claimed much of its land from the sea, you know, dikes and polders, my boy. Nothing in the world less controllable than the sea, and yet the Dutch found a way to control it. And now, in my own way, I have done the very same thing. My turbines capture the ocean's infinite energy, which I use for my own purposes. Is it not remarkable? It's the most remarkable thing I've ever heard, Rene said, equally impressed by Mr. Curtin's remarkable vanity. No doubt, said Mr. Curtin. He clapped his hands together, but enough delay. Even greater things lie ahead. Renard, much greater things. And we must waste no time achieving them. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. He began paging through the rest of his journal, inserting the ribbons. Mr. Curtin was turning the pages with disheartening speed, but Rene dared not interrupt again. 
Instead, he allowed himself one glance, and a brief one at that, behind Mr. Curtin, toward the hill path, leading up beyond the dormitory. A short distance from the bottom, the path curved around a large potted cactus. Nothing unusual about this, there were many such cactuses set along the institute paths. This particular cactus seemed to have several arms. A cactopus, Rene thought with an inward smile. There, said Mr. Curtin, holding up the journal, with the ends of ribbon sticking out here and there. Satisfied? Oh, yes, sir, said Rene, though in truth he was disappointed. He could see many dog-eared pages remaining. He would have liked to bring more ribbons, but the timid helper had given him all the sash material she could spare. She'd been afraid to disappoint him, but terrified to give him more. You're quite welcome, Mr. Curtin replied, as if it were Rene who'd been given the present and not himself. And now you may leave. All right, we'll stop right there. Like and subscribe. <laughs>